Leslie, I want to first thank you for the opportunity to read for you today. Um, thank you for the great questions. Um, I will say this, that as I was looking at the charts, um, I did utilize uh, some of my own proprietary style of uh, utilizing or looking at uh, astrology. And so um, I had to sort of go dive a little deep into some of these questions. Okay, so I want to give um, some context to this reading first, and then I'm going to dive into the first question about the vaccine. Okay, we are in a very important time um, in the uh, history of our nation. And uh, it, it feels that way to most, um, but it is truly that way. Um, and the reason being is because um, we are in a place where we are dealing with a nation um, with the energy of power, okay, and the power of our nation. Um, and this is the fifth time in the history of our nation that we have um, had to deal with uh, issues of power. And this is really a return to the first time that we had to deal with issues of power. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to share with you uh, my screen, share with everyone my screen. Okay, does everyone see that there? All right, great. So um, <clears throat> this is the chart of the United States. And if you take note, um, the birth date is July 4th of 1776, 5, 10 p.m. in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And so this was actually the um, date in which the uh, Declaration of Independence was drafted. Now, what I'm gonna do is uh, around this chart, I'm gonna wrap around the transits. And so this is actually, um, the inner wheel is the chart of the United States, the birth chart of the United States. The outer wheel is the, um, is the transits where the planets are presently and what i'm really focused on here are is the planet of pluto okay if you take a look here um this is pluto where it was at the birth of our nation it was at 27 degrees capricorn 27 degrees and 33 minutes capricorn and this is really um represents the power of a nation okay and and what it does with that power how it utilizes that power um and so this is a very important point uh, within a nation, especially a powerful nation such as the United States. And so one of the things that we need to do is we need to actually go back to the birth date of our nation, just so you can get a sense of what was going on. Okay, at the birth of our nation, uh, yes, Pluto was sort of at its beginning or at its birth point, if you will. And prior to this time, uh, there was sort of this coming into being or this birthing of the power of the nation. And so obviously, um, prior to being a, uh, you know, America, the United States of America, uh, we were a collection of colonies um, that were ruled by the British. And so um, really the birthing pains begin when we start to see clashes uh, between um, the, the uh, colonists as well as the British. And so um, the first sort of set of birthing pains, and I'm really using an orb of 10 degrees, uh, actually begin um, shortly after the Boston Massacre. Okay, and so um, to look at my notes here, uh, we're looking at uh, really starting around 1770. Okay, and this time period wrapped up or ended about, uh, let's see here. We saw this time period wrapping up about 1777. Um, I want, no, no, I'm sorry, that's not correct. That would be 1782, okay? So just about the time we were wrapping up the, the war. Um, and so really that is the, the coming into being of our power, okay? This is the birthing of, of our nation. Um, the next point of power would be when Pluto, uh, transiting Pluto gets into a right angle okay, with Pluto, um, natal Pluto, or Pluto at its birth. And so if we just take that out to um, <clears throat> the years following, and just excuse me as I just kind of breeze through this here. We start to run into this period um, roughly around uh, 1838. And in fact, I think the dates that I have are um, 1838 to about 18... 58, okay, um, 1859. And so this is really um, the time where we were uh, expanding our, um, our size as a nation. This was uh, when we were 
uh, really bringing forward the ideal of manifest destiny. And so it was during this earlier period where we had the um, Mexican uh, American War, which uh, brought us um, the territories of Texas as well as California. Um, it was during this period of time where we actually established the um, southern border as well as the northern border and actually the western border um, of our nation. And it was a time um, like smack dab in the middle uh, where you had the gold rush that took place. And so, um, you know, we uh, not only did we expand as a nation and expand our wealth as a nation as far as territory, but we expanded our wealth as a nation as far as uh, resources as well. So it's during this time where we actually found the largest load of uh, silver as well. And then there became the question during this time leading up to the Civil War, where um, the question of what, what are we going to do with this new territory? Is it going to be free states? Are it going to be slave states? Okay, but there was sort of this question of, um, you know, how do we utilize this, this sort of new wealth of the nation? And this period sort of ends uh, with the election of um, with the election of um, Abraham Lincoln. Okay. Now, if we go to the third um, sort of aspect that we're looking at here, and what we're looking at here is we're looking for Pluto to be in opposition with Pluto. And I can just tell you, this started up um, around 1928. Okay. So right, uh, 1928, 1929, right before. Um, the, the crash, okay, the big stock market crash that led to the depression. Um, so what's interesting about this time is that we went through a depression, but in that depression period, um, we also went through uh, the New Deal, okay, which came about March 3rd, uh, 1933. And so what you had there was, um, during the New Deal, you had a consolidation um, of the nation's gold at that time. So it's very interesting, had we not found these deposits of gold, had we not um, sort of won the uh, Mexican-American War, would we have had the resources to sort of pay for the, for the, uh, for the, for the New Deal? Um, and also into this time, we go, uh, we make the decision, and this time actually ends around, uh, right around the time um, after uh, we stormed Normandy. Okay, is when we see this time closing out. And so when you think about it, um, we had a really isolationist uh, sort of view at that time. Um, and we did not want to enter into the war and to engage um, sort of uh, Hitler and Mussolini and even Japan. And, and so what happened was uh, due to certain circumstances, um, Pearl Harbor, um, we decided to jump into the war. And this really changed the course of events in American power. And so really coming out of World um, War II, uh, war, coming out of World War II really represented America at an apex of power. Because do understand this, um, at the beginning, at the conjunction, we see the creation of power. At the square, we're seeing some degree of change that needs to take place um, in order to uh, a sort of a testing of one's power, if you will. At the opposition, you're seeing an apex of one's power, the height of one's power. But then that brings us to the next square. And the next square actually begins in 1980, no, I'm sorry, 1978, 1979, roughly around then. Um, and, and it really sort of lines up quite neatly uh, with, the, um, with the Reagan administration, okay? And what we see when we get to the third square or the, the second square, if you will, is really a waning of power in the cycle. And so this is where power may be misused. This is where power may be wasted. Um, and so this is typically what we see in, in, in the cycles um, when we're talking about these, um, these four corners. And so when we look at the um, Reagan administration, there are a few things that were going on. Now, mind you, this square um, and this point is one of those points that is not necessarily marked heavily by war but you will notice that the other ones have been. Um, but there were important wars that were taking place at this time. And one of those wars was the Iran-Iraq um, War. Uh, another war was, that was taking place was the um, Afghan-Russian uh, War. And those wars, um, even though we were not, uh, you know, overtly involved in those wars, we were covertly wielding our powers in those wars. 
And also what you had happening with the nation at this time is that you started to have this, um, you started sort of the beginnings of this um, great transfer of wealth, okay? Uh, mind you, the 80s was a time of the yuppie. Um, and this was a time of trickle down economics. And so um, what we were doing in a sense was, uh, when you look at it, in a way we were sort of giving away our power, okay? This is sort of sparking, and even though it's sort of started with Nixon, um, this is sort of a, a rise that you're seeing um, sort of happening in the recognition of China. Um, this is also a time where you actually start to see corporations uh, moving jobs um, out of the United States, which actually would continue through with NAFTA. Um, and then also you had the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the Iran-Contra affair, okay, which was a very serious, um, maybe even abuse or misuse of power, okay, by, um, by America and by leadership at that time. And so here we don't see necessarily America at its best moment, but I think that this is very interesting to understand, seeing as though um, there's sort of like this current throwback symbolism to say to the Reagan era, if you will. Now, as we um, advance to where we are now, this, um, we come into the second conjunction, Pluto conjunction of the United States. And so this is why this time feels so very um, important in our lives. And it is really um, a clear throwback to the time of the revolution. And so when you see certain symbolism that's come up um, during this, okay, period, uh, such as the guillotine that was placed outside of Jeff Bezos' house, um, or the toppling of statues, if you will. Uh, these are all symbolisms that sort of throw us back to the time of the revolution. Now, one of the things that I wanna say here is that um, one of the issues with the, with the revolution was an issue of power and the American value system as it related to money and power, who the Americans or who the colonials thought that should hold power and, and really hold power over the purse, if you will. And so in this sense, you have to think of colonial America and Britain as being sort of one body at first, but there was some disruption that came into being. And so when we look at the confrontation that is taking place in the streets of America right now, when we look at the confrontation that's happening between protesters and um, you know, uh, law enforcement and, and, and government authorities, uh, I think this harkens back to some of the original um, challenges and struggles that you saw during the revolutionary time. And so in that sense, I will say that, um, and I'll, I'll just leave a pin here, I will say that things have sort of taken an unfortunate turn um, with the administration of Donald Trump. And I don't say that from a political um, perspective or position. I say that because um, from a perspective of symbolism, this administration actually represents um, the authority, okay? And, and in that way, sort of um, puts them in an uncomfortable position of, uh, of being sort of aligned with, uh, you know, King George III um, back in the revolution. And so it's just anyone who would sort of hold power and wield power right now, um, they're very much under a spotlight. And it's very interesting because this particular time and period um, where Pluto goes into this, uh, this second conjunction actually began on uh, January, I believe it was 18th, 17th or 18th of 2017. And um, Trump's inauguration speech was, I believe, two, uh, two or three days later, okay, on January uh, 20th. And so in this way, it, it sort of lines up um, with this, the synergy of the, of, the, um, of the second conjunction. Now, um, with that said, and I, I know I wanted to, to talk about the vaccine first, but I, I think I can sort of, um, where I'm at right now, it feels comfortable to sort of talk about uh, the election, okay? And, and does Trump win the election? Um, <laughs> This is a very pivotal election, obviously, because the time in which we're in, because we're in this second conjunction. And, I be, and because it falls in the second conjunction and because it aligns with the symbolism of the, second, um, of the first conjunction, 
uh, I would say that due to um, the coronavirus, okay, due to the, uh, the lockdowns and their economic impact, um, he has been hit with a series of unfortunate events that are going to stack up against him. Okay, so on paper, I do not see Trump winning, but let me continue on with that. Um, what I see in Trump's chart, okay, and I'm just going to bring this, uh, bring Trump into the mix here. Okay, now we bring up Trump's chart here, and I'm going to bring up some transits. These are the transits of where we are now. Um, basically, Trump in the beginning of this year, 2020, was hit with a series. I mean, when I say a series, I'm literally counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, seven unfortunate aspects that retrograde throughout 2020. And so that means that all of these aspects pretty much hit um, right around the time that the outbreak was coming to the United States, okay, right around the time where we saw um, the market tanking. And so um, February, April time. Uh, the thing about a lot of these aspects is that they're, they are um, aspects dealing with outer planets, Pluto, Uranus, and Saturn. And so therefore, um, they face a lot of the retrogrades that will be taking place this year, meaning that these particular aspects will be exact um, at least three times throughout this year. Uh, and a lot of these don't really culminate or conclude until after the election of 2020. And so um, I think that had these, uh, had COVID not happened, had, had the lockdowns not happened, had the you know, economic um, and market stability, instability had not happened, Trump would have maybe had a better chance in a free and fair election. Um, but due to these aspects coming in, due to sort of, um, you know, the light that they've sort of shown on him, even in the eyes of those who would have maybe supported him a little more. Um, I don't think that, he, I don't see him being able to survive a popularity contest um, come November 3rd of 2020. Um, so I will say that some of these aspects that we see Trump having to deal with this year, um, one of them is Pluto. You'll see it at 28, uh, 23 degrees Capricorn. Uh, it's in a conquanx with his sun sign. His sun sign represents his identity, sort of the light that he shines upon the world. And, and definitely with it in the 10th house, it represents his reputation. And so what, he, um, what this conquanx is doing, what Pluto is doing, is it's stripping away um, some of sort of the, the, the light, if you will, or the glamour. It, you're, you're being able to sort of see, um, you know, who he is in, in sort of a raw fashion. Uh, and, and the reason I say that is because all of us sort of have this um, allure to us. There's, there's, we, when we look in the mirror, we can see our mistakes quite quickly and quite readily, but someone who does not know us, they're going to look at us um, and they're gonna sort of see a light. They're not gonna focus necessarily on our mistakes or, our, or our, um, you know, all of our inconsistencies, if you will. But in this way, it's like um, those things are sort of being brought forward. And so the veneer or the light is being stripped away, if you will. Um, and this is, you know, obviously due to the particular circumstances that the Saturn, Pluto, Jupiter conjunction is causing, because that does have a lot to do with the turmoil um, that started in the beginning of 2020. And it does have a lot to do because these three planets sit in a conjunction throughout 2020, have a lot to do with why the United States is having such an issue um, getting back on our feet. Uh, but back to the, uh, Trump. So we have a stripping away um, of the veneer due to situations. And so when you're thrown a problem, um, you really get to sort of see um, how you face it. He's also dealing with this Pluto-Saturn opposition. Saturn represents the structure of, structures of our lives, oftentimes um, represents our ambitions as well and has to do with our careers. And so in that way, um, there's uh, transformation, um, change, regeneration in, in areas that we usually want to be stable. Um, the next aspect is going to be uh, Uranus, and Uranus is actually in a um, in a minor aspect with uh, the Sun. And so, with this uh, Uranus, is bringing in sort of a change 
um, and anxiety, if you will, um, to Trump. And so I'm sure this time is not a very comfortable time for him. Um, we also see uh, Uranus square to his Pluto, uh, which can also be a um, very destabilizing time. It's a time where we feel very vulnerable. Um, we have Saturn in a conquox aspect with the ascendant. And so this is sort of a challenging time for relationships and how you project your energy to the outer world. Oops, excuse me. Um, then we have uh, Saturn, which is opposite um, Venus, which is never good for popularity um, and, and never good for, for one's um, not only popularity, but also one's um, finances, even though I don't know, you know, that is a really a case that applies, but definitely um, one's intimate relationships are definitely being challenged at this time. Uh, and then we have a Saturn conquest to Mars. That's going to be uh, sort of having to change directions. Okay, so uh, with all of these aspects, they don't end until after the election. And I will say this, that even though he has Saturn at the end of the fifth house, which is typically uh, would represent a good time in a person's life, um, if the stage were better, I think it would be a great a better time. Um, but I think that the stage does not necessarily present for, um, for a lovable presentation. If, if you are the main character of a tragedy, okay, um, people are going to look at you and look at your character and view you on stage a different way than if you were, say, the hero of a love story. And so I think that this is sort of the way in which we can look at it. Also, another thing that I think is challenging for Trump is that with all of these challenging aspects that I just named off, uh, as we get into 2021, he is really going to step into this Neptune square to the sun. Um, he will by that time, and let me just advance this some months uh, as we get into the beginning of January. And so we definitely have this square, which is going to, uh, wow, it's gonna be challenging because it's gonna challenge his vitality. Um, I think that there'll be some serious um, stress uh, and, and the inability to really deal with that stress. And then when we see Saturn at the beginning of the sixth house, which is the house of uh, work routine and health, the job definitely gets harder um, no matter what job it is. And health is definitely um, challenged at this time. Uh, so I would say this, uh, in a free and fair election with Trump uh, on paper, he does lose the election. I will say this, however, and I need to go back to the chart of the United States because I don't think that this is going to be um, your normal election. And so I think that um, when we do get to election time, uh, there is going to be a lot that could be contested uh, after this election. Um, obviously due to the, uh, the circumstances um, as they are right now, you can just imagine with people talking about mail-in ballots, um, with, the, with the numbers of uh, COVID rising, with there being questions of how um, states have handled the COVID, let alone how states are going to handle an election in the middle of a pandemic. Um, there's a lot of moving parts here that don't really uh, lead to the best case scenario. Okay, the best case scenario is we, if we would have certain things fall into place at certain times. Um, but we don't have the organization and structure right now for that to happen. And so I think that um, our best case scenarios, uh, the windows are very much closing for America's best case scenarios. Okay. Um, and so what I wanted to bring up here, I brought back the chart of the United States because uh, here are the, where the planets are right now. And what I'm keeping my eye on is Mars, because we said we were going to talk about the Mars retrograde. Um, there's a lot of activity uh, and a challenging activity taking place in the fourth house of the United States right now. The fourth house of any country is gonna be a house that gives us a sense of nationality or national sentiment, national pride, if you will. Um, you know, sort of uh, how well uh, grouped we are um, as, a, as a unit, okay? And how, how strong we stand under our national identity. And anytime that you have Chiron in the fourth house, it is a time of challenge. Um, where there is not this sort of ceiling, feeling or sense of, of a national unity or national identity. Um, the last time that we saw Chiron in the fourth house was uh, a time right after, or as we started bringing troops back from uh, Vietnam War. Okay, and I think that 
um, throughout that period that we saw in the 70s, um, there was sort of a question of, you know, who we are as a nation and, and also, also a question of national pride as well. Um, and we see Chiron right back in the fourth house. And so that becomes um, a bit of a challenge. Also a reason I think that we were dealing with an outbreak. It's funny, you will see a lot of outbreaks um, happening with uh, Chiron at the beginning of the fourth house of the United States, including, I believe, um, the Spanish flu uh, outbreak. But the real culprit here is Mars, as we see it in the fourth house of the United States. Um, I went back to study Mars in the fourth house of the United States, and it, and it doesn't always necessarily lead to trouble, um, but it typically does sort of carry a theme of, of challenge on, on home soil, okay? Um, one of the most poignant uh, Mars retrogrades to a fourth house came during the Civil War, and it came during, um, I believe, the Battle of Antietam, which is still to this day is the bloodiest um, military uh, event in, in history. Um, but it was also during that time that we got the first draft of the Emancipation Proclamation as well. And so um, as I studied the Chiron of the United States, um, the wound, if you will, Chiron is the wounded healer, um, there, there is this sort of interesting in, uh, energy between uh, race and also the division of, of race or the, 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 the discussion of race. Um, that's brought about. So, so I think it's a very interesting time. So what Mars is going to be doing is it's going to be retrograding over this Chiron um, throughout the remainder of 2020. So if we just take a look at right, I'm sorry, I just advanced it too much. Um, if we go by the week here, okay, um, right about September, you're going to see right before it exits the fourth house, it's going to start to retrograde back over. Um, we will still see this retrograding happening after the election, okay? So um, that's why I say what we're seeing in the streets of America right now where you have um, U.S. law enforcement and military uh, standing um, and, and actually uh, shooting at uh, American uh, civilians, I think that this is a very... One of those things that's very dangerous during this Mars retrograde time, and one of these things that I think that could really steer the national sentiment. Um, one of the things, um, particularly as you see in Portland, and, and it just, you know, it's, it's interesting, a lot of the protests that originally had, uh, emerged out of, well, first of all, the lockdowns, and then they emerged out of the George Floyd protests and other police brutality protests. But what you're finding is that this is turning into um, sort of a bigger thing. It, it, quickly spread around the world. Um, but more and more people are sort of finding their voice or their will to protest um, as they see more and more uh, events taking place. And so when you do see military um, in the streets uh, versus Americans, that doesn't necessarily sit well, I believe, with the ideals of what most Americans think America is. I don't think that most Americans see uh, us as a martial law state, but we're more so seen as a, a nation of um, free individuals. And so in Portland, where you're starting to see mothers and fathers and veterans, and these different people who really are, you know, the backbone and strength and the virtue of America, um, you know, standing up against uh, sort of this, this force, um, I think that you really have sort of this flashpoint where anything can happen between now and the election. Another reason I'm saying that is because with Mars being in the fourth house, it is also coming into a square with these three planets that have really set off what we're now dealing with in 2020. And so it's uh, definitely an amplification of something that uh, started. So when I see the rise in cases, yes, that could be a part of it. Um, when I see now the, the standoff and standoffs and, and the potential standoffs in more uh, cities around the nation, I think that this is also a danger as well. I will say this, that there is still a potential um, because this is an a, a war aspect with Mars being in square to a, a Pluto-Saturn conjunction or any type of Pluto-Saturn relationship. This is definitely a war aspect. Um, one of the things is that you could potentially get an outside war. Um, and I think that your biggest adversary right now and the biggest threat to American power would be China. Um, and, and the war that is taking place, and I believe that has already started, is a war right now over intellectual property. 
Um, we've got Uranus in Taurus right now. Uranus in Taurus was very prevalent. And the last time we saw this was in World War II. And it was actually the beginning of World War II before the United States um, got involved. And anytime you see the planet of change going into a sign that represents land, territory, and property, um, oftentimes you see uh, the changing of borders. And so that's what we saw during um, World War, at least the initial parts of World War II, um, a lot of changing of borders and a lot of invasions. Uh, I but I- a question in here, please, Will. Sure, Because sure going thing. on right now is India, China. Have you yes. given any thought that this could be representing the India-China border war? Well, it's interesting because my thinking here is that it would have to do primarily with the United States. My thinking here is because um, Pluto is at a conjunction, okay, or even an opposition if it was not an opposition. Um, so I would say that the Outside wars can have an effect upon us, but only if we are directly involved. Okay, I, I think that at the, the, the conjunctions and the uh, the opposition, um, you know, it's it's direct involvement, and so it's either us fighting within ourselves or um, us fighting against um, someone else. And and I think that what we're really looking at here is the security of our nation and also um, maybe a transformation of the value system of our nation, not so much a transfer uh, in a value system, but actually in the way um, in which we handle money, okay, uh, economically, because of all of the things that we're dealing with, with all of this activity being in the second house, the second house being the house of a nation's value system, a uh, house of a nation's money, economy, um, and its land and property as well. Um, but just quickly back to Uranus, I would just say with Uranus, I think one of the things that um, this has gotten me to think a little differently now, uh, because the world is, is pretty much what it is and we've discovered the land that we have, um, you can definitely see, say, changings of borders, but we haven't seen a great deal in change and shift in the world map in a, in a great deal of time. Uh, but when I start to think about property, possessions, territory, uh, we do need to consider where Uranus, which is also a planet dealing with technology, comes into uh, to, uh, uh, Taurus, the sign of property. So we may be talking about intellectual property wars. Okay, And so when we talk about um, the war over 5G technology and the expanse there, um, when we talk about, uh, you know, the, the issues between China and the United States and, and sort of this um, tit for tat closing of consulates, uh, consulates recently. And so, so this is an area where I would say an escalation of um, some type of war, especially because this is around our elections as well. And so I would say that not only China, but other countries um, in this day and age, I would say this would probably be um, the most interfered with election, at least I would expect it would be, um, in the history of our nation. And so there's a number of things that could happen. We could be talking about domestic unrest, which we definitely are gonna get more of, I truly believe. We could be talking about an escalation, a quick escalation of war. Um, we could be talking about a natural disaster, okay, which brings unrest to, to the home front. Um, but, re or we could be even talking about the spread uh, and spread and possible mutation of COVID-19. But all of these um, potential scenarios really throw a free and fair election into turmoil. And so therefore, um, what I am expecting uh, in relationship to the election is that um, on paper, Donald Trump does not win. If Donald Trump uh, happens, if there happens to be a clear winner on November 4th, which I would say that the, there's going to be a, a high, higher probability that we will not have a clear victor on November 4th. Okay, I do believe the election will be contested. Um, and I do believe that even if uh, you do have, say, uh, Donald Trump GOP contesting the election, um, or even if you have uh, a situation where there's a refusal, refusal to leave office, um, I don't believe that Donald Trump would be in office uh, longer than the fall of 2021. And that would be the absolute longest. 
Due to the health issues or due to? Due to, um, I think due to uh, sort of the pressures that come with the health issues. And, and um, I think that what's happening this year, all the, all the aspects that I was talking about that were hitting his sun sign um, causes one to, to sort of have a, a vulnerability and, a, and a sort of shake, shakes one's belief in themselves. Um, and then with the Neptune energy that's going to be coming in in 2021, um, I just don't think that he has the confidence. Um, you know, the things that are happening right now uh, would would be rough for anyone to deal with. OK. And so, you know, I do believe that uh, the, the, the ship that he's trying to steer right now, it's, it's hard. And I think it. it, it you know, he's he's sort of taking some defeats that um, anyone would may may feel as though is unfair to them. OK, um, so I just don't think that, uh, especially this year, um, the the tools that he has in his toolbox, the tools that have gotten him this far, are not the tools um, that are going to be able to get him through this year and also be able to sustain any challenge to his presidency for next year. Okay, so yes, I do see Biden eventually getting into office. The one thing I want to say about Biden, however, is that Biden is not really a strong uh, leader. Okay, and so Biden's chances um, and effectiveness in office is going to have a lot to do uh, with his ability to pick a um, a running mate, and it's I think to me it's going to signal a lot. Um, when we look at Joe Biden's chart, one of the things I'll say right away with Joe Biden, when we look at um, the fact that his tenth uh, house, okay, we see Virgo on the cusp of his tenth house. Virgo is ruled by uh, Mercury, and we see Mercury in the twelfth house. So anytime the tenth house, which is the house of career and leadership, um, and, and reputation uh, falls into the house of the unknown, okay, or, or the house of um, that which is hidden. It, it's not a person who's, who's necessarily a leader per se, but they do better at being the power behind the throne, okay? They don't really do really great at being the face of anything. However, I will say this, that with Biden around election time, um, he receives less challenge to his chart than Trump does. Okay, significantly less challenge to his chart. What I also see for Biden too is with Biden, um, there's something about, there's something of a, of a feeling of pause that we get. Um, he gets, if he, if he, it doesn't feel like he, if he does win and he's named the victor uh, November 4th, 2020, it doesn't feel like he's effective right away. Okay, so it does feel like there's something that sort of holds back his ability to be able to be as effective as he wants to be. But what I see for Biden, however, is that I do see Biden's aspects coming on extremely strong um, as we get into 2022 and 2023. So when you ask the question, um, if Biden wins, do I see him um, finishing his four-year term? Yes, I do see him finishing his four-year term, but I only see him being a four-year uh, president, one-term president. I, I one, one, I don't think that um, he will have the desire to run for a second term, um, because I do see that there will be some health issues uh, as he sort of gets into say 2025. But he has a very, he has a lot of strong support in his, uh, in his life until about 2025. One of the things that I'm looking at here is Uranus um, in his chart. And so Uranus right now in the fifth house, not too bad, but it's slowly working its way into the sixth house, which is the house of health. Okay. And another thing with Uranus is Uranus is going to be in opposition to sort of this cluster of planets that we see here. And so one of the things that when, as we get into 2025, this cluster of planets is significant, but I think it becomes very significant as we get into a Uranus sun opposition. Um, 
by 2025. Yeah, 2024. Okay, we actually start to get into that opposition. Um, so I think that by 2025, I just don't think that there's a desire um, to want to run any any longer. So even if, it, um, like I said, Trump uh, eventually, you know, is not uh, reelected, um, even if he is reelected, um, there is something going on in the the fall of 2021 that that really um, it's almost like a giving up, if you will. Uh, so he starts anew. Some something going on around that time. Um, yeah, I suppose it would it be closer? Would it be a blowout? Um, I would say that if you have a free and fair election, um, then it's likely to be close. I would say that if you have any interference in the election, then you're um, likely to have uh, either a very thin margin or a very wide margin that seems somewhat suspicious. Okay, so that I do feel as though that is going to sort of be, but I do feel because um, of the uh, Mars retrograde during this time, whatever is to occur, and you have to also think too, this Mars retrograde is going to be opposite Saturn and also um, sort of square Mercury over here. So it's going to be a really rough time, a really time, um, rough to have a free and fair election. I'm going to get back to the Republicans. Uh, no, I'm going to answer that right now. Do the Republicans hold the Senate um, or do, and do the Republicans hold the House? Uh, it's going to depend a lot on how, how quickly they are able to decouple themselves from Trump and the Trump administration. Uh, not so much that, you know, and I'm not trying to be biased in any way politically at all, but I think that because of the, um, just the, the symbolism of events, um, because this administration is this administration that is in authority at the time of, say, um, the COVID, the lockdown, the, the, the unemployment, and all these unfortunate things that have come in 2020, um, that that does place them on the symbolic side of, say, being um, the, the administration of George, um, King George III. And so the survival of Republicans is going to be their ability to separate themselves from whatever debacle is going to be surrounding this election. So if there is a dispute as to the outcome of this election that throws this country into and throws the markets into peril, um, that throws, you know, uh, protesters back into the streets, which if that does happen, that's something we'll start to see um, becoming really strong in November and December for sure. Um, that's not going to end well. And if, if you have a situation where the longer the fight um, for the, the election goes on, um, then the, the slimmer the chances are for the Republicans to be able to make a heavy impact. Um, I think that the the survival of the Republicans is going to be um, those Republicans who uh, decoupled from uh, the administration and administration's actions early. Uh, because I think that we're going into this next six months, um, any administration, okay, any, any authoritarian power um, is going to have trouble sort of dealing with uh, maybe some of the mayhem and unrest that we're going to be looking at and, and facing. Uh, especially if but you have you a... Didn't you didn't quite answer the question is, will they hold the House and Senate in November? Oh, in November. Um, no, I, 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 I don't think that's going to be the case. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I didn't, um, I didn't really look at that question from that perspective. Um, and, and I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't see that part about the November point. So I'm going to, I'm going to defer on that one um, because I, I, this election season is going to be very awkward. I think everyone has sort of placed their bets already, um, but I, I don't think that uh, in the, um, you know, two years in, I don't think um, as we get to 2022, I don't think that that's going to be a very successful time for, uh, for Republicans. Okay.